to Stories I Ate This Month, a segment where I review all the books I've read, the movies I've seen, and the TV shows I've binged this month. My name's Christine. Hello! So I read three books. I saw so many movies this month, I'm so excited to talk about them. I watched, oh my god, I'm so excited to talk about Looking for Alaska, the John Green adaptation. <laughs> Off the hook, but the phone never rang. On the beach, no claws, no fangs. So the first book I have to talk about this month is the Book Explosion October Book of the Month. This month we were working with Penguin, and we read The Fountains of Silence by Ruta Sapetis. I don't know if you've yet to have the joy of reading a Ruta Sapetis book. They are so, so excellent. They're historical fiction. When I used to think about historical fiction, I'd think of a very dense, slow read. Ruta's stories are so accessible and so character driven. She does such a great job of building the world around these characters so that you really feel like you're there with them in the time period that they're taking place. So The Fountains of Silence takes place in 1957 in Spain when Spain was under the rule of Francesco Franco, a dictator. They're living under all these oppressive conditions. We follow three siblings who are just trying to make a living after the Spanish Civil War where both of their parents were killed. They are in a constant cycle of debt where they cannot earn enough to get out of the situation they're in. Our main, main character of those siblings is Anna, and she works at the Hilton, which is an American hotel in Spain. And a lot of wealthy businessmen from the United States are traveling to Spain and staying in this hotel, and she is a maid at this hotel. Our other main character name is Daniel, and he's from Texas, and his dad is a huge oil businessman. He's 18, he's about to go off to college, he wants to be a photojournalist. We see Spain through his eyes, through his camera lens, and it's just so beautiful. Seeing life through all these different points of view and learning about this time, it's just fascinating and heartbreaking and the love story running through it is so I loved it so much so many wonderful storylines going through it so many wonderful characters it was amazing highly recommend you pick it up oh my gosh I've been raving about it for like five minutes straight the first movie that I watched this one was the Downton Abbey film I've watched and loved Downton Abbey but I never watched the final season the great thing about this movie is that there is a 10 minute recap beforehand narrated so cheekily oh they did such a good job with it so I'm with my boyfriend who's never watched Downton before and he loved it and wanted to watch Downton after seeing this movie. I cried three separate times. I cried when it just started and the theme song came on. It just brought back so many memories. I forgot how much I love this show. You forget till you see this movie how fantastic these characters are. That's what really makes the show so, so compelling and wonderful. These characters. Oh, Maggie Smith's characters, the sisters, the Irish guy who married the youngest sister. I forgot about everyone. I love them so much. All the people who work in the house, I, oh, it's so good. Oh, there's this moment with Maggie Smith toward the end that just really got me. I was just like, oh, God. Oh, it was excellent. A plus, loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. The next movie that I saw was a Korean film that I knew nothing about going in. We just booked tickets. I had no idea what I was getting into. It's called Parasite. I think there's a lot of Oscar buzz. I loved this movie. It was so unexpected because I didn't see any trailers. I didn't see anything going into it. It's a thriller, but it's also really comedic. The characters are fabulous. You just don't know where it's going. It explores morality and the gap between the rich and the poor. And you fall in love with this family and you're rooting so hard for them. It's a dramedy thriller. A plus to Parasite. Let's see what I wrote in my notes here. My original review here was, that was a crazy, very well written thrill ride full of sympathetic characters. You really don't know who you want to succeed. I think that's what what I just said from memory. So if you have the chance to see it, if it's at your theater, go see Parasite. Alas, the next book that I read this month was The Beautiful by Renée Adier. I listened to the audiobook and she has a French accent. Now I associate this book with a French accent. Not that I can do one. The French accent is really hard for me. I have not been around enough French people. So The Beautiful is the beginning of the return of vampires to the YA genre. This story takes place in 1872. To New Orleans. Renee's writing is so atmospheric. This is like sultry, mysterious vampires. That vibe carries you through the book so hard. I really love our lead character, Celine. She's just come over from Paris and she's living in a convent. In Paris, she worked for a fashion designer and she's a very talented seamstress. At the convent, they had no real job correlation for her. She's very headstrong. And the overwhelming drive that she has is to be independent and to find some sense of power. 
past experiences have left her really searching for a way to empower herself in situations where previously she's felt out of control. And I think she's always been brave, but this just gives her this endless supply of courage where whenever she needs to do something that may put her life in danger, she's like, whatever, I'm doing it because <laughs> I am strong. And if that dude can do this, I can do this. And it's really great to watch her navigating this new world that happens to be full of mysteriously powered people. There's a serial killer murdering people around her and the really hot dude that's kind of into her that she's kind of into but it's also like mm, you're a liar and I know you're dangerous. It's a classic vampire struggle and it really captures the essence and feel of that gothic New Orleans era. If that's your thing definitely hit up the beautiful. And like I said I listened to the audiobook. If you don't know I'm an audible affiliate you can use my link in the description get your first book for free. The audiobook I think I would actually maybe direct you to read the beautiful with your eyes rather than the audiobook if you have the choice because I had to keep rewinding with the audiobook just because I don't know if it's the French accent or the French names but I felt like I kept missing things and having to rewind and listen again so that I got it and comprehended it whereas if I was reading it I think it would have sunk into my brain more but that's because I have more of a visual memory so names and stuff stick with me more especially when they're French and I like don't know how they're written <laughs> when I see them with my eyes. The next film that I saw this month was Zombieland 2. I recently rewatched Zombieland 1. What I really loved about it was this tender, almost rom-com feel that it had, even though it was a really super gory movie about zombies in the end of the world. Well, Zombieland 2 was fun and it had a couple funny moments. It was lacking that clever cuteness that the first one had. I feel like a chunk of this movie was cut out in edits because they set it up with rules in the beginning. The same sort of thing with rules. There's different kind of zombies and then you don't see see all the different kind of zombies. They don't really come into play in any clever way. And it just felt like if you're a screenwriter and you're setting that up, you're gonna see them come into play in various integral ways, but one of them you don't even see at all. There had to be a scene with that kind of zombie to included in the opening. The best part of this movie, my favorite part, was the after credit scene. Stay for it. It was so unexpected and it was so great. You'll know it when you see it. So I'm gonna give it a B minus. The last book that I read this month was Rebel by Marie Lu. The finale to the Legend trilogy that we all read and loved back in the early 2010s. Or maybe you've read it more recently. I loved them so much but I had a huge problem with the ending because we didn't get closure with my fave couple and oh it was just it was so nice to have that in Rebel. It was so beautiful. You also get to know Eden who is Jay's younger brother. He's older now. They're 10 years older which I love. It's not really mentioned or highlighted that they're 10 years old Older, but that means that Eden is 22 and Day is in his late 20s and it just was super cool to realize that he's my age. He's working in Antarctica for their version of the CIA. We really get to dig into that Antarctica culture with the levels. Eden's storyline running through it wasn't like why I was reading it. I love Eden. He's great but I w I'm there for Day and June. If you read the Legend Trilogy you want to read this. If you haven't read the Legend Trilogy it's fantastic. I, I would say it might be the best dystopian trilogy all around from that time period of YA. The next TV show that I finally finished was one of my most highly anticipated TV shows of the year and that was Carnival Row. It's an urban fantasy. It doesn't take place in our world. It's in a different world where there's a continent humans evolved in and then there was a continent that different sorts of creatures evolved in. Their country is being ravaged by war so a lot of them have migrated over to the human continent and of course there are so many biases and prejudices against these different creatures living in amongst the humans. The world and the characters set up in Carnival Row were so rich and fascinating, but the writing felt very generic. But the overarching plotline and the story just didn't measure up to the potential that was there with the characters in the world that we were in. And especially in the final couple episodes, so many things the villains said were like straight out of cliche villain handbook. And hopefully the second season we dig a little deeper into the really fascinating parts of this world. Like the best episode of season one was episode three. It was the flashback episode. If you've seen the season, you know it. It's when we go back to when Orlando Bloom's character was in the war with Cara Delevingne's character and that is the heart of the show. There wasn't enough of it in this season. Like that was the most interesting episode. Being in that land where the fairies have lived their entire lives and learning about their culture. We never really dug more into like who was at war with them? Why are they at war with them? I really feel like the show should have started 
there and made their way to maybe the Burge. Cara Delevingne's character is fantastic and I feel like she's so underused in the plot. Anyway, a lot of potential in the show. I'm gonna watch the second season. I believe the showrunner from Daredevil is taking over so that should be fascinating because Daredevil is amazing and we'll see what he does with Carnival Row. I think I'd give season one a B minus. The next show that I finished this month was my Breaking Bad rewatch seasons four and five. I did not appreciate these enough upon first watch. I think I appreciated season four. I think I binged that one. It's spectacular. Amazing television. Walt hits this eye in the middle of his morality hurricane where he could tip either way like he could go back to being a decent-ish person but then he tips all the way evil. <laughs> season five though I did not appreciate that enough when I watched it live but there's so many little things that come back around. It's so beautifully done. The finale is perfect. Perfect. Again, I didn't appreciate it because I was so sad at the time. It was just ending and there was that heaviness on it. But wow, it's perfect. Oh, it was so good. A plus. Breaking Bad. And then when I finished that, I got to finally watch El Camino, the Netflix Breaking Bad film, which is why I started this rewatch in the first place. This did not feel like a movie. It felt like two more episodes of Breaking Bad where we get to find some resolution with Jesse's character because the end of Breaking Bad, Jesse's is more an open-ended resolution. It was really nice to get closure there, but it wasn't what I was expecting in terms of a movie. But it was two more episodes and I loved having them, so I don't really know how to rate it. I think I'll give it an A minus. I was thinking maybe there's gonna be a time jump or something, but it literally picks up the second we leave off on the finale. The next TV series that I watched this month was the Hulu adaptation of Looking for Alaska, and oh my God, it was so amazing. It was the best thing ever. I didn't realize till the end that it was made by the guy who made the OC, but it had such an OC feeling. It was so nostalgic because it takes place during 2005, and that's when I was in high school. Everyone's wearing clothes, and like referencing stuff like that. And at one point they watched the OC in California. Came on, I was like, oh. I have a whole list of everything I love so that I wouldn't forget to rave about anything. I loved how much more we got to learn about Alaska through this series and the Colonel and seeing the stripper prank with our eyes. It was so different. I just, you get so much more out of seeing that visually. I was laughing and crying at the same time because I was both sad and proud and happy and it was funny. And it was just so different. John Green in the best way. It was just like everything in the book made even more amazing with this visual adaptation. My favorite was episode four and that's the Thanksgiving episode. I loved everything at the Colonel's house with his mom. His mom was so great. And all the actors were great. The Colonel was perfect. Miles was perfect. Alaska was perfect. Takumi was perfect. I mean, it was just, it was so great. I didn't cry reading the book. I was already spoiled because I read it like 10 years too late. But the performances, you can't not cry watching them. They do such a great job. I loved seeing Jake and getting to know him. And I loved the extensive war going on with the weekday warriors because again, you get more of a feel for that. There's more pranks. I loved seeing the people that were infamously ratted on before the book started. I loved Jonah from Veep as the eagle. I loved the scene at the dance with the Macarena. I loved Alaska and Miles playing Truth or Dare. Hearing her talk about what her future would look like, it was such a beautiful scene. I loved Lara. I love seeing more of Lara and seeing more of who she is. Oh, I love the basketball game montage. And Miles was the perfect Miles. Everything was perfect. A plus, 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 plus. The next thing I watched this month was the first season of Fleabag. It's super quick. It's only six episodes on Amazon. I had no idea what to expect with this. I only knew that it won 50 million awards this year. Dang, was it wonderful. It breaks the fourth wall in a way that I've only always wanted to do. What I wrote here as my official review. Hilarious comedic timing and cutting emotional storyline that reveals itself along the way. I saw Jojo Rabbit! I've been excited about Taika's newest film for so long since I heard that he was doing it. I love his sense of humor and the heart that's in all of his films. Jojo Rabbit was no different. Scarlett Johansson's character in it is so wonderful. Like I've never really connected with the characters that Scarlett Johansson portrays in different films. I just always feel like she plays these cold cut off people. And I connected so much with her character in this. The actor who played Jojo was so wonderful and Sam Rockwell's character was hilarious and Alfie. And of course Taika's portrayal of an imaginary friend. If you don't know what it's about, it's about a kid living in Germany during World War II in training to become a Nazi and his imaginary friend is Hitler. It's an A. And then 
finally, this month, I saw The Lighthouse with Robert Pattinson in the super scary Green Go Goblin from Spider-Man, Willem Dafoe. What a strange film. I mean, it's a man slash men going insane on a small island running a lighthouse in 1887, I believe. The performances are fantastic. It's super dark, and I really, it's the type of film that afterward you pick apart and you draw different meaning and theories from what the filmmaker's trying to say and what actually was going on and I love that and I have my theories but I'm not going to share them here because I don't want to like spoil anything I want you to be able to draw your own conclusions but I love having that sort of a discussion it's definitely a film that a film student would be like let me write a paper about them. like I could write a paper about this <laughs> and I love that it's shot it's shot like 4-3 you know square like, Robert Pattinson goes to a super dark place Willem Dafoe's character talks like an old she made tea the whole time it was an excellent film it was very weird so if that's not your cup of tea you know maybe don't watch you don't have to watch it, but if you're a Robert Pattinson fan, you might you want to watch it just to see. Just to see him do this role. It's super good. I'm gonna give it a B plus, because it's not like my cup of tea in terms of a storyline. It was like insane, you know, insane stuff was happening, but it was really, really well done. Those are all the stories I ate this month. My name's Christine. I'm also an author. My debut novel is out. It is a rom-com coming of age story. It's super easy, fun, happy making read. I'll have a link in the top of the description if you're interested. Please let me know your thoughts on anything I discussed today or anything that you watched or saw that I didn't mention. I love your recommendations. I'm Christine. I make videos every Tuesday and I'll see you next time.